maybe a more focused question, but it's still big. It's in relation to Hobsbawm and uh, Thompson, both be historians quite well known. Uh, and you've mentioned, both of you have mentioned at least Thompson and you more Hobsbawm a lot. And I'm just curious, because you talked about this kind of uh, bias in terms of uh, the lenses of looking at certain things and not at other things. And I just wanted your own sort of expertise through your own work, what you found to be most kind of problematic in terms of their contributions, because you've also said very good things about them. But, but it's hard to tell other than this kind of bias against a progressivist idea of history what what exactly for you is more problematic? Okay, well my, my you can take focus on it, either one of them. I mean. Okay, well if, if I if again go back to Captain Swing, it's a very interesting book to read because I know it's a great bit of history, historical research. One of the things you get across when you're reading it is, is that <coughs> I'm going to read a go going from a classical Marxist position. Okay, they go into this analysis and um, they get all this information. And they kind of want to look for certain things, they want to look for other things, but what happens is you feel they're totally, they're kind of fettered in this book, okay? So they, they do things like go, how could this have happened? So they think, oh, we better go and look and see if there were organizations already existing in communities, you know, that, that kind of could have led to, they look for friendly societies, Methodist groups, they're looking for this kind of formal organizations that, that must lie behind it. You know, it must have some impact on what it is. They kind of don't find much, you know, they're a bit like, well, you know. Because what they're looking for is some kind of structure in there, you know, some kind of structure they understand, something that, that, that fits in with kind of like perhaps ideas about how working class organisations develop. <coughs> and they can't really find that. Um, then they get excited because they come across these really strange events. They, they come across things like marches, as I mentioned before, where there's clear politicisation. You know, there's kind of Republican ideas. You know. People you remember, you remember the swing riots. It's not that long since the Napoleonic Wars, you know, 15 years of war against France, you know. And these is Labour's marching around, you know, with French flags, with tricolours, you know. And so they kind of say things like, well, they were probably just trying to annoy the authorities, right? And, you know, you look at that and you think, well, I don't know. And then they kind of do some stuff on cobblers, like right? shoemakers. They find that, you know, do some studies on shoemakers, they find that in all the villages, or, you know, if there were rioting swing villages, they would, you'd probably like need to have three or four times the number of shoemakers in the village. They were, you know, famously radical shoemakers, they were, you know, Republican ideas of the franchise. So they're kind of looking at all this stuff. But what's problematic is, it, you know, they, they, they can't let they can't <coughs> themselves go down there too far. You know, they kind of find this stuff and then kind of dismiss it. And then they, look for some organisation, it's not there, so they kind of drop that. And they're clearly having a problem in understanding how such a wave of, of, of you know, activity could actually happen. And they don't really, I would argue, come to many conclusions, other than the fact they put all this exciting information up there, that they found, and they get to the end and go, at the end of the day, it was just, a, you know, it was limited. It was completely limited. It was like, you know, it was, a, it was based around wages, it, you know, it was related to very limited demands. It wasn't possible for these rural labourers really to go any further than they could, they did. And although there was elements of politicisation, it doesn't really work. And that, that kind of a, is really the fettering of classical <coughs> Marxism. It's saying, well, you know, they're not in the right position. Now, you know, and to put it bluntly, it boils down to this, right? Okay, they weren't peasants. They recognised that. They were rural proletarians. But you know, a lot of classical Marxist theory believes that, you know, it's about positioning of groups in society in terms of their potential for revolutionary movement. And what, what classical Marxism says, well, you know, the countryside is backward. <laughs> The cities are a breath of, breath of fresh air, so it's going to happen in the cities, it can't happen in the countryside. Secondly, um, they say things like, it's got to be the industrial proletariat that does it, because they're at the centre of power in the capitalist, or the most influential point in the capitalist, you know, uh, in capitalist industries, and you know, they, it's got to be industrial proletarians that do it, it can't be these other people, so they have to put that kind of fetter on what they're doing. Another kind I would say, well, you know, it's got to be sections of working class are in the factories because they're the only way they can for, produce these organisations that we recognise as being revolutionary, like political parties, you know, formations like that. So all these fetters are on it all the time. And I think that's the problem I've got with, if I was going to be really specific about what they're, what, what's going on. They've gone in with these preconceptions and therefore the history doesn't quite fit in and they have to dismiss things and drop things. And I'll argue that the swing movement was 
necessarily revolutionary, but I would say it would be wrong to suggest that it was purely a wage dispute. That would be, uh, hopefully that answers it. <laughs> Is that it? Do we to Yeah. Uh,